I'm almost tempted to start this video by making a really controversial statement, something like, professional book critics are rubbish. <laughs> no, no, no. Many critics make fair and interesting critiques to help readers understand if this is going to be a book they enjoy. But every now and then I come across a review which is so unfair and makes me feel like uh, flames, flames on the side of my face, breathing, heaving breath, heaving R.I.P. Madeline Kahn. So the book I'm talking about is Yun Mungo by Douglas Stewart, the follow-up to his Booker Prize winning debut novel Shuggy Bane. This is one of the most anticipated new novels of the year. It's been highly publicized and mostly critically acclaimed, but as with almost all successful writers, there comes along a book critic that wants to be the dissenting opinion that says, actually, it's not a good book. Sure, it's good to have a balance of opinions. I personally loved this novel. Not only did I connect with it, but I felt it was well written and well constructed. And not everybody is going to love books that are both lauded and popular, but sometimes it feels like critics revel in cutting down successful novels for the sake of it rather than fairly critiquing them. And it frustrates me because it often feels like professional critics can say what they want without any accountability. So let's critique the critics review, shall we? <laughs> Given the cover of this novel, I feel like I'm allowed to be as queeny a snap diva as I want to be in this video. The review I'm looking at is Kevin Powers in the Irish Times. Power is a writer and an academic who teaches creative writing and literature at Trinity College. I've not read any of his books, and I feel like one of the issues here is that creative writing teachers and writers can become professional book critics and it can feel like they approach their reading as if grading a student submission or evaluating a book based on their own preferred writing style. And I think that's what happens here in this review, uh, which also takes a smug satisfaction in cutting down Douglas Stewart's novel. So let's take a look at this review paragraph by paragraph, and he starts by skewering Shuggy Bane. The day was flat, goes the first sentence of Douglas Stewart's Booker Prize winning bestseller Shuggy Bane. The prose of the novel is flat too, a plodding low realist style that shades frequently into unintentional Hilarity. As Shuggy's father, Shug, drives his taxi around Glasgow, he wondered whether taxi driving was in his blood. Between him and his brother Rascal, it was practically a family business. His father would have enjoyed it too, had the shipbuilding not killed him. Must one have a heart of stone to read about the life of Shug Bane without laughing? I feel like flat prose is a critique that critics use when they want their to be more narrative flourishes and fancy language. Plotting means that he wasn't emotionally engaged by the story, even though there are many dramatic and heartbreaking things that happen in this novel. And low realist style feels like the sort of snobbish description that would come from a teacher at Trinity College. I'd call the prose style of this book straightforward, but that's an entirely intentional decision on the author's part because it is effective in conveying vein the story that he wants to tell. And I had this disagreement with a number of people around the time this was nominated for the Booker because some people were frustrated that there was little narrative innovation used in this novel. And no, there isn't, but there doesn't need to be. The style of a novel should suit its ideas and story to deliver the best impact. And I feel like the straightforward style of this author's prose 
does that perfectly. Powers also ends this paragraph with an oh-so-clever play upon Oscar Wilde's critique of Charles Dickens' novel The Old Curiosity Shop, where Wilde wrote, one would have to have a heart of stone to read the death of Little Nell without dissolving into tears of laughter. And here Powers twists this to cut down the way in which this family's working class conditions have impacted their lives through generations. Classy. So next he gives some examples of the prose style. The adventures of poor Shuggy, the gay teenage son of the abusive Shug and the alcoholic Agnes, constitute a parade of misery, preyed upon and abandoned by the adults in his life and living alone aged 15 in a rented tenement room, Shuggy has only his collection of porcelain dolls to comfort him, a hundred pairs of painted eyes, all broken-hearted or lonely. He had spent hours with their made-up stories, the thick-armed blacksmith amongst the angel-faced choir boys, or his favorite, the seven or so giant baby kittens, smiling and menacing the lazy shepherd. Baby kittens? Just kittens, surely. And why seven or so? Is it seven or isn't it? All right, Parade of Misery makes it sound like the author is reveling in or artificially manipulating his character's pain for dramatic effect. Douglas Stewart has spoken on multiple occasions about how the characters he writes about are very similar to the kinds of people he grew up around, and I feel like the truth of that experience shines through in the writing. Power's critique feels like it's coming from someone who doesn't have empathy for individuals in this position. There are countless gay teens who have been ostracized because of their sexuality, shunned by their own parents, and made homeless who've had to take refuge in the imagination. This is what the author is conveying in these lines. So to pick it apart with this professor's red pen as using a redundant word and not being specific enough totally disregards the emotions and meaning behind these lines. And if the bulk of your critique is that several words could have been edited out of its 430 pages, you are seriously missing the point. He quotes some more lines as examples of what he characterizes as flat and plodding prose. Meanwhile, Shuggy sat in the dark, listening to the unsteady snores through the tenement walls. The morning chill had turned his naked thighs a tartan blue. Elsewhere, characters have alabaster shoulders. Catherine stole a sly glance at her mother. Shug narrowed his eyes. Doesn't all this sound familiar? The porcelain dolls are the giveaway. They're kitsch. And so is Shuggy Bane. So again, he's using his creative writing instructor's pen to point out a number of lines that he feels should have been written differently before dismissing the entire novel as kitsch because he finds it garish and overly sentimental. And there's an allusion again to Wilde's critique of Dickens, and I feel like Powers probably thinks that Douglas Stewart is kind of like a modern-day Dickens. And I've read a number of Dickens books, and I find his sentimentality a bit hard to take as well, but I think Douglas Stewart is doing something quite different in his books. There's emotion which is visceral and realistically presented with characters who feel fully rounded and complex. Now, finally, almost halfway through the review, he gets to the book that he's actually reviewing. Yun Mungo is Shuggy Redu, where back in the Glasgow tenements, period the early 1990s, Mungo Hamilton is 15, Protestant, and beginning to deduce the nature of his sexual self. His mother, Moma, is an alcoholic, neglectful, capricious, often absent, his brother, Hamish, is a violent psychopath who leads gang raids and 
totes a homemade tomahawk. His sister, Jody, doing her best, is sleeping with an older married man. His dad, luckily for those of us who remember the depredations of Shug Bain, is dead. Mungo wondered what it would be like to have a father. So he seems to be saying that Yan Mungo is mostly repeating what we found in Shuggy Bane. And yes, there are many superficial similarities in the time, place, and the socio-economic position of the characters. But I think a close and considerate reading of this novel if a critic could be bothered to do that, would show that they're actually quite different. The situation is quite different from that first book, and the choices these characters make, these characters who come from very similar circumstances, they are very different, so they are not the same book. He continues to summarize the new novel. One day, in a quiet forgotten place behind the tenements on the edge of the motorway, Mungo meets Jamie Jameson, who is Catholic and who keeps pigeons. Mungo and Jamie fall in love, crossing the cultural boundaries. Will things go wrong? Of course they will, though for much of the novel we don't know precisely how. What we do know is that in the aftermath, Mungo has been sent out of Glasgow on a rural fishing trip with two shady sots nicknamed Gallogate and St. Christopher. We know they're shady because early on they ask Mungo, so have you got your pubes yet? This also happened in Shuggy Bane. The point of the fishing trip is, according to Moma, to make a man out of ye. In a way, it does, but poor Mungo has to suffer quite extensively before we get there. And so does the reader. Art, let me say at this point, is only partly about what you represent. It's also very much about how you represent it. In other words, style matters. Yeah, of course it does. And again, I think many of the stylistic choices that Douglas Stewart made in these novels are both intentional and effective. But he gives some more quotes to support his review. Let's look at the style of Jan Mungo. The city was alive with the sound of buskers, goes a fairly typical descriptive phrase. Mungo's tormentors, St. Christopher and Gallogate, regard him with slitted eyes. Looking at Gallogate, Mungo thinks the years had clearly been hard. The two drunks exchanged a sly look. St. Christopher nodded in agreement. The natural landscape around them on the fishing trip is unspoiled. More cliches. Mungo's hazel eyes could bathe you in their glorious warmth. He has an unruly mop of hair that made women want to mother him. He stands stock still. He watches a young gain member flush scarlet. Then they raced, lungs bursting through the wet streets of Moma. The demon always, was always there just under the surface, even on good days. As Moma waves Mungo off on the fishing trip, her son lowered his gaze. Mungo's sister Jody, rivulets of tears, her face was a waxy pallor. Birds are described as swooping. Jody watches the hairs on her lover's back dance in the breeze. When he takes her to a fairground, the lights, the sugary candy floss, and sweet peanutty smell of popcorn had made for a dizzying night far from home. So he gives all these examples which he deems cliches, but to me it feels like the author is just describing exactly what he wants to convey and create a mood which the reader can really feel. I mean, when you run really fast, you do feel like your lungs are going to burst. Why shouldn't the author just say that to evoke this feeling rather than formulating another way to say it. He picks upon all of these lines when really he's ignoring the meaning of the story, which holds them all together. And what Douglas Stewart does so well with his straightforward prose is to create an atmosphere to fully sense the world of these characters and feel the dilemmas that they face. So he summarizes his opinion. In perhaps the most representative phrase in the whole book, we hear that a lethargic malaise had fallen over the tenements. You don't, of course, need lethargic when you've already got malaise. 
It is not the tenements, but the pros that have been afflicted by malaise. Yan Mungo has the aura of a deeply felt book. It often achieves a somber pathos, but more often it wobbles messily back and forth across the unforgiving line that separates pathos from bathos. Ooh, he's got out his red pen again. That's very condescending, and in the end he's reveling in his own wordplay rather than saying anything substantial. I can just imagine him sitting at his desk, chuckling at his word choice and thinking, oh yes, I've delivered a fatal blow. <sighs> How smug and mean is this review? It focuses entirely on the style, which, as he says, matters, but it entirely misses the point of the style that Douglas Stewart has chosen because the critic is brushing over the content, or if mentioned, he finds it cliched and obvious. This novel describes things like the pressures to conform to a certain form of masculinity, the effects of substance abuse within a family, the desire to abort an unwanted pregnancy, the homophobia which can separate people that are in love, and the sectarian conflict in Glasgow, and it presents all of these things in a way which is fresh and new and unlike any that I've read before. If you haven't personally experienced any of the issues that Douglas Stewart presents in these novels or know anyone who has experienced these situations, lucky you. But it doesn't mean that these things haven't happened and it doesn't mean that people like this haven't suffered or continue to suffer in this way. And it doesn't mean you shouldn't extend some empathy for the issues that these novels present, or at least mention them in your review without rolling your eyes. What this review fails to do is convey a full description of the real content of this book and what the experience of reading this novel is actually like, because instead he chooses to highlight a collection of texts to support his misguided claim that the book's style isn't innovative enough and that its emotions are affected. Obviously, I felt differently. If you don't connect with Douglas Stewart's writing, that is fine. Reading is subjective, but I think this critic is writing from the perspective that his opinions are objective truth when they are not. It frustrates me and it seems like a mean-spirited attack on an author uh, that is critically and commercially more successful than he is. If you want to read about how this novel made me feel, I'll put a link to my non-professional review in the description below. But I'd love to know what you think of Douglas Stewart's books, and do you think my critique of this critique is accurate or fair? Let me know in the comments below. Thank you for watching me rant, and Long may we honor the spirit of Madeline Kahn. <laughs>